Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Destination Big Leagues. In today's episode, I've got Ivan Gorban, a senior data scientist at Kareem. Kareem is one of the largest ride hailing apps in the Middle East, intending to be a super app. Thank you so much for coming on to the platform, Ivan. Uh, could you quickly run us through, you know, your journey to becoming a senior data scientist at Kareem? Hi, Ronak. Uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, yes, so Kareem is a super app company in the Middle East. Uh, it's a unicorn or unicamel uh, company. It operates many different markets like Egypt, uh, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, etc. Uh, so my journey, my journey to to becoming uh, to become a senior data scientist at Karim was maybe not as straightforward as, as it could be. So I got two master's degree. So I got I uh, studied two times, and uh, I got like three different careers, including academic career as well. Uh, so I worked as a researcher for some time, and then after all this, I shifted into data scientist, uh, into data science, and became data scientist in Karim after some time. Yeah. Awesome. So I know you did a lot of your formal education in uh, Russia, right? And uh, a lot of great mathematicians, physicists, uh, uh, you know, have sort of stemmed from Russia, right? And the post-Soviet uh, Union and, and the Soviet Union era, right? What makes it peculiar that, you know, Russia is able to churn out such high quality uh, professionals within the STEM field? Uh I would say that it 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 all it it is all connected to uh, demand, like uh, the eternal rules of supply and demand, right? So, uh, Soviet Union formed a strong demand for STEM specialists, for engineers and scholars, and at the same time there were a Cold War, which required much uh, development in terms of rocket ship building in terms of aviation and military uh, science, right? So there was uh, actually high demand on such specialists and there was an isolation at the same time. And uh, due to both these factors, uh, they had to develop inner, uh, inner school of mathematics uh, and engineering uh, in general. So, yeah, I think... I think this is the main factor of this development, right? Right. So you, you, you mentioned you did two masters, right? What were those two masters in? And, you know, how did those uh, masters kind of lead up to you kind of pursuing data science, you know, knowing that that was the field that I wanted to go into? Yeah. So uh, these two masters, the first master's degree was in uh, applied mathematics in Moscow Aviation Institute. And the second master's degree was in economics in New Economics School in Russia as well. Uh, so how did they lead to uh, data science? I would say that it started, all, all, all of this started before actually formal uh, uh, education in the university. So it started in uh, middle school, I think, when I read the book of, from Isaac Asimov Foundation. And there was such a, uh, such a discipline, psychic history. And so there was a Harry Seldon, I think, uh, a scientist who invented this psychic history. And he tried to predict uh, behavior of people, behavior of societies. He tried to predict what will happen and how to influence this behavior in order to improve the world and... Uh, uh, reduce the problems in it. So I was really fascinated by this possibility of prediction of people's behavior uh, in large scale. So I wanted to to learn it, right? And at that, a bit after this, I found that physics is really fascinating because in some sense, it's trying to predict, but like elementary particles, etc., it's trying to predict uh, macro parameters of different things, right? 
uh, and uh, I decided to go to the uh, to the Department of uh, Applied Mathematics and Physics in Moscow Aviation Institute, and then I uh, had my major in stati in, in mathematical statistics and probability theory. Right uh, after that, I started working in in the bank, uh, in one bank, and uh, I became portfolio manager. But still, I had in mind this dream of mine uh, of like pred predicting behavior, etc. Uh, at that time, I worked a bit with machine learning, uh, so I uh, made some simple binary classifiers. I predicted um, defo default uh, events, for example. But in general, I I like felt that it goes in different directions with my dream. So I decided to go into economics, which is actually uh, work with such thing. So economics tries to predict people's behavior, people's, people's decisions, right? Macroeconomics, for example, it, it is con uh, focused on macro events and like uh, interest rates, etc. cetera. Microeconomics, in a, uh, it, it is about individuals mostly so it's really interesting so i went uh, to economics and i became a researcher in this field and i worked for a couple of years as a researcher and at that time i built econometric models and also i built uh, machine learning models uh, and i read few books in machine learning uh, at that time and found that okay actually this is it Right, I want to do this. Uh, when I finished my research work, I moved to data science and I started working as a data scientist in largest telecommunication company in Russia, and uh, worked there for like almost four to five years, I think, and then moved to Karim. Uh, started working with Karim a uh, couple of years ago. Yeah. So, so you know, you, you spend significant amount of time in academia and in industry, right? Uh, I guess, uh, what would you prefer? You know, what do you think is the best pathway to take to accelerate learning and have an impact in society, I guess? Okay, uh, thank you. I, I would say I would prefer that I prefer it in general. So I would prefer... Uh, uh, business business to academia um, why so it's just my personal preferences first of all right uh, I would prefer business part because first I like uh, fast feedback from the business right because when you creating when you're creating something uh, in industry you have this feedback it's uh, it's embodied in money it's embodied in uh in numbers which your uh, products given and you and everyone actually looks at it right everyone looks at it and uh, we see the results uh, it this feedback cycle is quite fast in academia you also can make an impact actually but that's the cycle is much larger in time so you see the results of your work, if ever you can see it very, with very long delay, right? Uh, so yeah, I would prefer business, I would prefer industry, but uh, in general, I think if anyone finds that academia is interested for uh, him or her, uh, they should try to pursue this. Uh, because anyway, it will be useful in business as well, right? Ac academic, academic knowledge, academic approaches, it is useful in business, uh, specifically in data science. So yeah, I would say like this. Right. So I mean, you know, do you find that you know uh, a sort of data scientists that come in from like the academic background uh, tend to have more impact in industry, or you know, someone who's just been a lifelong data scientist, maybe after undergrad has just gone into data science. And you know, been in industry. Who do you see tends to have more impact? I would say that uh, such two types they are different. Uh, the impact is determined by the projects they have, 
by the approaches they have the, by their uh, like inner organization uh, the type of thought etc cetera, etc cetera. so it is not so correlated with academic uh, or right away from the beginning industry background i would say what's different is uh, uh, focus uh, different in, in approaches to their work it's focus it's um, uh, maybe more detailed things in people with academic background by they but they have not only benefits or advantages but also they have some disadvantages for example they they tend to to have more complex solutions for example right and to business business usually prefer more um, not so complex solutions more e more easily explained more uh, uh, e easily built etc er some heuristics etc right and people from academia background they have a tendency to provide some complex solutions and not not in every sphere of business it can be implemented right and not everywhere it is profitable so i see such differences yes they are definitely may, uh, take place yeah exactly yeah i think uh, i think all business cares about is if i put x amount of dollars will i be able to 2x or you know sort of grow my money right i think everything's heavily financially driven because everything comes at a cost in business right like so uh, so i guess yeah i think that's a good analogy that you put there uh so uh in so, you know, just wanted to go through sort of Kareem, right? And how data science is run at Kareem. Kareem has a lot of data scientists, right? I, I guess your pillar and your backbone is basically on your data-driven insights. Uh, how is the whole sort of data science run at Kareem? You know, what are the reporting lines? Like, do you guys work with business stakeholders? Uh, how, how is, you know, the whole data science thing run at Kareem? Yeah. Uh, first of all, we... We really work uh, with uh, business, with business owners, with uh, like product product managers, very tightly. So I would say that um, that we have two parallel hierarchies in these terms, because uh, first of all, there is a product, and there are product managers who decide whether they need or not data scientists or on their projects right and or in their product uh they form a demand for data scientists and then data scientists uh come to products and starts working with them so i would say that hierarchy of data science itself it is made more for exchange of opinions for exchange of uh experience etc for example i can tell my fellow data scientists uh like I have such problems as uh, this and this problems. How would you approach it? They can help me in this. But when I'm talking about my work uh, itself, I communicate mostly in these terms uh, with the product manager, right? So it is very, very business oriented in these terms. So I like work with product manager. He is called like my dotted line manager, right? So he also... Uh, is really interested in my uh, in my development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I work with him, and for in in terms of my line manager, etc., it is mo done mostly for exchange of opinions of knowledge and uh, for like promotions, etc. Yeah. Right. So you know, uh, um, Kareem intends to be a super app and is on its way over there. Uh, you know, super apps are basically, how do you, I guess, how would you define what a super app is first, you know, before me going into like the super apps? Yeah, I would say that super app is a application, is an application which contains many different services. There is first, there is an anchor service. I would say as for Karim, it is right healing. Uh, there is an anchor service and which forms a critical mass of people who work, who interact with this application. And based on this service, you create different other services, such as in Karim's case, it's food delivery, it's groceries, it's 
uh, payment solutions, etc. Right. So I would say, yeah, uh, super app. It's it's an application which makes uh, life easier for customers in general because it contains many different services. Right. So, you know, super apps are pretty famous uh, in China, right? I mean, I guess the uh, incumbent super app is WeChat, right? Like a lot of Chinese people use it, even if they're outside of China. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I guess in the West, like if you look at the US and if you look at Europe, uh, it seems like, you know, there still hasn't been a super app that is sort of dominated or risen. Uh, why is that? Like, why do you think super apps haven't caught uh, up in the West? Uh, yeah, uh, I think, it, like, in my opinion, it is connected to maturity of uh, the market, of the companies which enter super apps, potentially. Uh, it, it also depends on competition on the anchor product markets. For example, in right hailing, uh, in the UAE, uh, Karim in right hailing was mostly monopolist in Dubai, for example, right? So it started with this. In if we are talking about WeChat, it's it was a messenger, it was a chat, which was also a monopolist in some sense. Uh, if we are talking about Yandex and Russia, Russia also uh, Yandex also was a monopolist in terms of almost monopolist, right? Uh, in terms of right healing. Uh, so I would say that their conditions and timing is like this. So you have very strong anchor product uh, and the company who owns this anchor product and who wills, who will to, uh, which will to develop uh, different other services based on this anchor product. Uh, this is the first one, I think. And the second one is the data privacy, right? If we are talking about Europe, uh, there are very strong, strict laws, uh, strict regulation in terms of data privacy. And um, it's just impossible to exchange different user data between different parts of potential super app company, right? Uh, which is key point here because you want to predict behavior of people you want to you want to uh, uh, offer services which would be interesting for the customer and this is possible only if you know the data about the user and if you have very strict laws in in terms of data exchange uh, it will be really hard right right yeah i think the europeans just make it so difficult to do anything right I, I was just talking to uh, a friend of mine from the uk and he was just saying europe is just good at telling the world what not to do uh you know uh they're the first added at the line you know it's always so difficult to innovate in europe but yeah i mean i think that makes sense uh you know the ue is quite different we're we're quite dynamic in terms of the laws and uh, regulations and stuff like that and uh, you know, we have a lot of incumbents out here competing to be the number one super app, Kareem being one of them. We have uh, Kareem, we have Noon, we have Talabat, we have Deliveroo. I guess you could maybe put Amazon in that category also. Uh, how do you think, uh, you know, the super app market is shaping up in the UAE? Like, are you all competing for the winner uh, who sort of captures the entire market? Is that how you view it? Uh, I see it not as a formation of some one monopolist. I would see that as a competition between uh, many players, May maybe not too many players, right? Uh, I would see it as a competition between three, four players. Uh, what would be the, uh, the field for competition? Uh, I think it's, it's as usual. It's about services and money, right? So first... If you can offer lower price to customers, it's a possi poss possibility to win the competition. Second, I would say that it's about services, right? So if you offer more frictionless experience for your users, if you offer better services for them, uh, it's much better. If you, say, offer... Um, over an experience when I, I can 
I can order food or grocery in five seconds. Uh, so I just enter the application and I can already order what I need. So I spent five seconds for this. If our competitor offers the same experience, but I should spend five minutes for this. So it, it starts depending on my value of time, right? Uh, if I, if I'm ready to spend more time on the same services or not. So the one who will, uh, who will provide better services, uh, will win, I think. Right. So Got it. that's why we we want to focus on this in this year, uh, on providing right. better you know, services. Right. So, you know, how, how do you think, like, is it basically creating each new service at a time and focusing on that, capturing the market, and then it aggregates into domination in multiple domains to kind of ultimately craft a super app? Is that how you see super apps sort of dominating the market? Uh, I think... Also, we can, we should look at synergies between different services, right? right? Like now in Karim, for example, if you order food, you will be offered to order something from groceries, some like uh, beverages from groceries, for right. example. So it's it's an upselling, it's an interaction and synergy between different services. At the right. same time, I don't know, for example, you are offering... Uh, you're offered to go from work to home and at the same time you're offered to order some food at home. Uh, so I think the more services you have, the larger potential for synergy between them. So yeah, I think uh, it will it should go in this way, right? In, in the way of synergy. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. So uh, I want to move into sort of generative AI, right? I mean, I guess as data scientists, uh, everyone's trying to tinker around uh, different generative AI use cases, because uh, ultimately, like if you are going to capture the market or dominate in your field or industry, you're going to use uh, AI, you're going to use generative AI to give you that competitive edge. Uh, what are your views on generative AI at Kareem? Like, uh, how do you see, uh, you know, generative AI uh, sort of, uh, uh, sh uh, shifting uh, your whole app experience. Yeah. So in Karim, we see generative AI like usage both internally and externally. So right. first of all, internally, we try to implement it in our internal processes in different ways, uh, like prioritization of different tickets, etc. Externally, for customers, we also see the usage of generative AI in different ways, uh, such as, for example, um, virtual assistant. Yeah, So you can formulate your thought or you can formulate your query in uh, human language. You say that, okay, I, I want something to eat for uh, lunch. And it will automatically provide you different options. So one option would be, I don't know, uh, order uh, food. Uh, another one would be order some groceries to prepare food. Uh, the third one would be to order a taxi to the restaurant, right? And uh, use dine out to have a discount for, for your order in the restaurant. Uh, yeah, so. Like right. This. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, customer uh, service uh, is, is definitely one of the big use cases, right? Uh, because I think what happens is, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how Kareem does it, but a lot of companies tend to kind of outsource the customer service and there's no sort of, you know, standardization of quality across like the customer service line. So I think, uh, you know, generative AI, uh, especially the speech to text translation and uh, again, the text to speech uh, is getting quite, good you know and uh llms are really good at understanding multi-layered queries you know so i do yeah. think that's one of the other experiences so i'm glad that you even mentioned this distinction of the way you're looking at it in terms of the internal and external thing you know i want to dwell a little bit into the internal thing right uh you guys have a lot of data scientists you guys have a lot of software engineers kareem is based on your you know your sort of your your core tech team uh have you been using github copilot 
Uh, yes, yes, we definitely use GitHub Copilot uh, because it, it saves a lot, lots of time, right? A lot of time. Uh, so also, also, uh, you know, uh, the, the different, different tickets uh, and the same questions in Slack can be a huge headache for people who should answer them. So we use in this process, we also use generative AI to like say, okay, your question actually was answered in this, this threads and the answer was like this. So it's like a uh, chat for, for, for such things. Uh, so yeah. Uh, we use and GitHub Copilot. We also use uh, extensively, right? Right. Uh, so I mean, yeah, that's 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 super interesting. Uh, I was just recently in my company, kind of giving a demo on MS three six five Copilot. I'm I'm guessing in Kareem, most of you all probably use Max. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so I, so, so for us and, uh, you know, we tend to use windows in our work, uh, and, uh, I was just showing, uh, my broader, uh, company, just some of the cool use cases of copilot. I think it's just so super interesting, you know? Uh, so, uh, I guess, uh, so you, from your personal end, like, do you think GitHub copilot, uh, how has GitHub copilot sort of helped you out, you know, in terms of your workflow so i see for example uh if i'm creating some uh class and i want to create some like i don't know not exactly class i want to create some part of the code which will uh which will optimize say optimize prices so it's enough for me to uh give the structure in general right and it will be it will be then uh filled for me uh with uh, more detailed structures and the only thing which which is left to me is to correct some somewhere where where, where the logic was not explained i don't know uh properly for example <clears throat> uh to fill all the stuff but it it saves a lot of time right it saves me uh, tons of time in terms of creating the structure, in terms of checking the problems in the code, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, test cases. Yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, I, I, so now you know, like, how how are you keeping up with learning all of the things within sort of generative AI? You know, there's, it just seems like there's always some new feature being pushed out. There's some new sort of foundational model that's been out there. So how are you keeping up with all of the you know, the new things that are coming out in generative AI? In general, so if we are talking about uh, our data science team, yeah, we have people who are uh, like evangelists of uh, generative AI. So they work specifically on generative AI in the, in, in Karim, uh, like on, on uh, virtual assistant, on different inner products. So they actually uh, read tons of articles. Uh, they uh, they write some blogs about generative AI, right? So me, uh, I specifically me, uh, I don't. Uh, it, it is not like my major field of interest, generative AI, right? So maybe I don't spend too much time on analyzing this and on orienting in all these uh, products or models uh, which are appearing. Uh, my main interest is in causal inference in general. Yeah. So I spend my time on like reading, reading uh, different articles, books, etc., and writing blogs as well on causal inference. Uh, yeah. So it's like this. Right. So can you, dwell, so I know that's interesting that you mentioned causal uh, inference. Can you kind of explain what causal inference is? Uh, yes. So causal inference is mostly about like cause and consequences, right? So it is about causal relationships between different events. So if I, a simple example, like classical example of causal inference is prices for ice cream for an ice cream uh for example you live in some country and you see uh you are selling 
ice cream. And you see that at some point of time, prices went up and sales went up as well. If you try to build a model of price elasticity here, right, you will see that, okay, uh, larger prices lead to larger sales. So you should increase price infinitely and you will have infinite sales in general. But it's obviously wrong, right? There is, uh, there is omitted variable of temperature uh, usually. So in the summer, prices for ice cream uh, goes, goes up, uh, they go up, and sales of ice cream also go up. <clears throat> uh, this is due to this temperature difference or like seasonal difference, not due to price. Uh, uh, the rise in sales not to, due to prices so it it has like in many different uh in many different frameworks and in many different uh, uh in many different events this thing is critical because usually machine learning methods they uh tell you everything about correlation but they tell you nothing about causation they don't tell you that this event occurred because of this. And if you build, if you are building predictive models, usually and quite often you are really interested in causal relationships. For example, you are trying to make discounts for your customers, right? And you are making these discounts, and you want to sell more actually because of discounts, not just to make discounts for the good of other uh, for 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 the good of your customers but it's also possible but in general you want to sell more because of discounts uh so here you should actually build an uplift model uh which 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 will tell you okay this treatment this influence on the price or on customer will lead to better sales or some results right so all the uplift modeling is built on causal inference. Uh, also, I think I find it fascinating that there are some methods for actually extracting causal information from the data. For example, you have the um, data set and you can extract causal information from there. Uh, yeah. Right. Actually, that's actually super interesting, right? It's like, uh, it's just like, figuring out what are the two variables that are creating the change, right? Sometimes you might look at a certain dimension or a certain metric and you make the assumption that that is creating the change in the model, but it might be some other weight that is uh, actually really changing it, right? And I, I think that's super, uh, super interesting. Uh, so I, I guess, you know, like data science is such an evolving field. You've said you've written blogs, you keep reading books and articles. How is some sort of a young and upcoming uh, data scientist uh, uh, how should he get, he or she get sort of prepared to get into the workforce, you know, to look for opportunities in data science? Uh, yes, I think that nowadays it's really much easier than in some time in the past that like, like in 2011, for example, right? Now it's much easier because there are plenty of books, courses, etc. But there is a classics like uh, pattern recognition and machine learning, for example, by Bishop, or uh, uh, different different uh, books by Hastie and others, like Introduction in Statistical Learning and Elements of Statistical Learning. Uh, there are also lots of different uh, courses on Coursera as well. If if uh, this someone this person is just starting their path, so Coursera might be useful as well. Although they have uh, quite beginner, usually they have quite beginner level. But for someone who is starting their journey, it's great. Uh, when I was uh, beginning data scientists, uh, data scientist. Uh, I, I was in Russia at that time, and there was there was a community open data open data science, and they had huge number of free courses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they still have, I think, uh, English language 
uh, based courses in machine learning as well. So I can share it uh, in the comments for the podcast as well. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I would say, yeah, reading, reading, reading these cor- uh, books, uh, going through courses and getting an internship as early as possible. It would be great. Right. And uh, how is how, how sort of, you know, the process of getting an internship at Kareem and I guess recruitment overall for a data scientist in Kareem? Yeah, the process is like this. So we have number of different interviews. Uh, interviews are in coding, uh, in algorithms and coding, uh, in mathematics and statistics, in machine learning system design, uh, general interview with hiring manager and bar raiser. So the person should go through this interview process and uh, and they will be accepted or rejected based on the uh, interview performance, of course. But in general, yeah, it's like this. It's uh, quite deep interviewing process. So because we want to see that person can implement, can design and implement different solutions without like, mistakes, uh, fundamental mistakes. Right. So, yeah. Uh, so I have this one question that I want to ask you, you know, before I sort of close it off. I guess if, you know, you were given a million dollars to start any business today, what business would you start? What business I would start? Mm, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, so I would, if, if it would be not right now, if it would be a bit earlier, I would start a business in generative AI, right? Uh, a bit earlier for a couple of years, uh, because I think that actually this part is developing, it will develop, uh, in general. And it looks like many people and many businesses, they cannot find the exact way how to apply it yet. Yeah, because there are many right. virtual assistants, there are many different AI assistants, but it looks like nobody has found this uh, best best application yet. Yeah, so I would right. I would spend it on this. Right, that makes sense. And uh, I mean, yeah, I think I think with the whole challenge with generative AI is just productionizing it and you know testing it so it's reliable. But yeah, I mean, uh, I think this was a great episode, uh, Ivan. Thank you so much for uh, coming on to the podcast any closing remarks uh how can people get in touch with you to reach out for your mentorship your advice uh yep yeah thank you ronak uh so you can you can keep in uh you can keep in touch with me on linkedin uh so people can get in touch with me on linkedin uh so also read my blogs uh blog blog posts on medium uh so I'm going to write actually a blog post on uh, uplift modeling soon. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think the main part here, just believe in yourself. So if you see that, that you want to go into data science uh, or neighboring field and you're afraid of it, don't be afraid. Just uh, steadily learn learn these topics, which we mentioned a bit. And just don't afraid. If if you have some difficulties, just write me, and I can help you as well. I can uh, I can give you some some information on this field as well. Sure. So I'm definitely gonna put the link to the Medium blog uh, down there, and I'll also put your link to your LinkedIn so people can get in touch with you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast, Ivan. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.